Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and perhaps even good evening. Thank you so much for being here and dropping by and joining me for another exciting session of In the Studio with Das 3 d It's wonderful to see so many of you. Yes, absolutely, Horizon. Hugs all around. It's wonderful to see you. It feels to me like I haven't streamed in ages, even though it was only two weeks. So it's one of those things. Time just plays these silly tricks on us every once in a while one of those things. Thank you so much, Swords for Two. I appreciate that. Be you. That is totally my motto. We are all us. And that is what makes us cool. And that's what makes us great as a community. And I think this is, this is a great um, intro actually into the session. This is how I'd like to approach today. It is all about HDRIs today. Not so much how to use them. I mean, I will cover some of that as well, but I don't want to tell grandma to suck eggs. I'm sure many of you know how to use HDRIs properly. I want to just touch on a couple of features that don't get a lot of screen time, like some of the more advanced things and some of the uh, beginner mistakes that, will often, that are often made. And then I'd like to move on to something much, much more exciting, and that is how you can create your own HDRIs from existing scenes. So there's many, many ways to do this, but there are two that I'm going to be talking about in particular. One is literally rendering something out from DAS Studio and using its output directly as a HDRI to speed up render times. Uh, this is especially useful if you're dealing with something like the stonemason scenes that are often very geometry heavy or something like the ultra scenery things by Howie Fox that are amazing in detail, but they can bring even good computers to its knees very, very quickly. So I'll show you how to do that, rendering these things out from Das Studio. And uh, that works with many scenes. I, I want to say most scenes, but it also doesn't work with some scenes. So we're going to cover a secondary a way to do this by rendering out a variety of regular PNG images from Das Studio in a bracketed fashion, and then we're going to combine them in Photoshop as a you know as a kind of a backup option. And um, rather than showing you all these things, as in look here, something I've made earlier, I want to do this all uh, kind of live on the stream. So that leaves a little bit of room for stuff that could go wrong. So bear with me. It means we just have a lot of time. To um, you know, to to chat and um, and do that. I hope we can. I hope there's something in here for everyone. Thank you so much for being here and guten Abend, indeed forgotten lectures. Good to see you all. Let me first of all perhaps show you an image that I've made with a HDRI uh, recently. Uh, that was this one here. I made this for a DAS Plus uh, live event. Another one of which comes up next Saturday, by the way. There was uh, we did this one, I believe, three weeks ago. We were going to do this session literally uh, last weekend, but I was invited to speak at a cancer conference in Hollywood. So I, I thought maybe we can postpone the DAS public stream and it went really well. And uh, so we're doing it. We're doing the public stream today. And next Saturday, we're going to do another DAS Plus stream in which I'm going to show you how to convert skin textures from older generation Genesis figures onto the new Genesis 9 figure. So very cool. If you're a DAS Plus subscriber, that'll be your treat for next Saturday. So this is an image of Victoria 9, and this is made with items from the Victoria 9 Mega Bundle. And uh, this is made with a HDRI. And uh, the cool thing about them is that they provide both lighting as well as a background if you wanted that. You don't have to use them as a background. I could have superimposed all these things in the background in Photoshop and render her out transparently, but I didn't do that. This is the, the, the background that actually came from the HDRI that I was using. And I, uh, I find that doing it this way speeds up render times enormously. Sometimes you have things like the, um, the mega terrains that are really good for landscapes, but the moment you put a character in, it's really difficult to combine these two things with one another. So um, if we are creating our own HDRIs from that, we do this by placing a spherical camera at the position where your character or where your subject would be. And um, that then renders out not just a flat image, it renders out essentially like a two by one really distorted image that then can be used to be projected on the sky dome. So I'll explain a little bit about how that works. And then, you know, that we can make an image like this. So one thing that beginners often mistake is that they either have to use scene lights or HDRIs. And I would say use both. So um, while HDRI is a good starting point, it is often necessary to add additional light sources to it. Because if you're thinking about something like an outdoor shot where you have a you know strong sunlight going from one direction, then that might cause some harsh shadows. And if you think about um, 
people in the street taking a photo, that is literally what they would do. But even that would look nicer with a camera, like a fill-in flash uh, from like from here, usually like a little pocket flash. If you watch professional p photographers, they often have an assistant that is off to the side, taking a bounce board or reflector and uh, looking at where the sun's coming from and then bouncing that back into the character's face to illuminate things that would otherwise be in a harsh, disgusting kind of shadow. That's not all though. I've also added some lights at the background here and that brings up these little metallic bits over here and these little highlights over here. And uh, there's also one behind her head, I believe, that goes and illuminates, you know, just gives her a little bit of a, uh, just accentuates the, the, uh, the corners here so that she separates from the background. So um, the cool thing about HDRIs is that they speed up render times because the background, had this been um, like a, like set, then every grass stalk would have to be calculated and you know every tree would have to be calculated. And that takes resources, not so much for viewport navigation, which is you know kind of slow that way, but also light bounces that have to be calculated. So by making that calculation once, I can then go and render this in multiple uh, settings out. So I'm saving myself some work there. Sadly, I don't know where that scene is, otherwise I would have shown you that in DAS Studio. So one of those things. But once I find it, I will totally show you. Let me go bring up my point of focus. And let's start with uh, having a look at how we work with HDRIs inside DAS Studio. I'm going to use... This is just an empty scene here for now. Uh, and I'm going to go and bring in an assistant, namely a primitive. And I like a primitive because that's just really, really easy to, to maneuver. I also like to use the uh, surface tool and then add, hello, there we go. I would, I like to add a metallic shader to that. And it's a nice idea that when we do put a HDRI in there, like a metal, like a titanium, platinum, something like that, iron, I platinum, platinum. That's my that's what my wedding ring is made of. So there we go. So um, this is this is kind of the the first important point I'd like to make that if you have anything metallic in your scene, like now I have a metallic ball here, you benefit from having a HDRI. If you only use scene lights and only have one object in your scene and you're looking for those beautiful metallic reflections, you might find that they don't exactly come out because you need something to reflect in the metal. So if you have literally like one or two scene lights and a character and the character is wearing something with metal, you think, hey, that metal shader is not working. What's what's going on there? The reason for that is, is that the rest of your world is black. So the metal reflects that, i.e. nothing. Maybe, you know, a couple of highlights from the from the scene lights, but there's nothing else to reflect. And um, that's often an issue. So if you remove the HDRI completely, then those reflections, those beautiful reflections will go away. If you have anything with metal, you benefit from having a HDRI in your scene. And um, mine is already loaded. I'm going to see this on the render settings tab here uh, under environment. There is this thing here. That is the default ruins image that comes with Das Studio. That is loaded by default. If I switch on draw dome here, then I can see it. And you think, yeah, well, Jay, that really doesn't, doesn't look like much, does it? And it doesn't have to. It doesn't need to be. What it's doing is literally so the image looks blurry like that. They can be square. Like usually they're like two by one aspect ratio. And what's happening here is that we have a really large sphere on the outside of our scene. And onto the inside of that is this image projected, like spherically projected. So that means that this, well, the moment I move my cursor away, the white spot here, like just above the horizon, like the white spot is in fact the thing that is causing the the light we can literally find it by going around and uh, find the image if you had a higher resolution image you can actually see that this is with filament by the way that is showing me that so let me go and bring in a different hdri just so that we see this a little bit uh, clearer and um and i'll show you what happens next let me go and browse to one that i've downloaded from a website called polyhaven any one of them will do. I'll use Belfast Sunset and I'm using a 4K version so it's not actually that large. I'll go load that in. Takes that studio a little bit of time to process and Filament will eventually preview it but iRay will do a much better job at, um, at previewing that. So let me go switch over to iRay. Takes a second and uh, there we go. So this is now 
somewhere. This is, first of all, this is a bit light. <laughs> so this is a bit intense here. So I think that's my, my, first, my first hurdle. I do see some reflections here in the darker parts here. I can see some kind of a sky, but it's too, uh, too light. So the first thing that I'm going to do, thank you, Brian. By the way, Brian is one of my moderators. Brian, Nate, and Julia are here to moderate your questions and give you links and uh, advice in case I'm not noticing your chat, which I'm prone to do. I do apologize for that. But uh, I, I, will, I will try to keep an eye on the chat a little bit later on once we, once we get going. There's a lot of rendering to be done, so I have, I have a lot of time for questions today. Let's make this a bit darker so we can see this. There's these two items here, like under environment, under dome, I can see environment intensity here, and I can see environment map. Each of these has a numerical um, value here, and each of these will either increase or decrease the intensity of that sky dome that we've got projected here. So I'm going to go and just use the environment intensity rather than map, even though they do technically do the same. And later on, we will see why it's really beneficial to have two sliders here. So I'm going to go and put, instead of one, I'll, I'll type in 0.5 and see how that fares. So it's, you know, it's a little bit darker. Uh, it's probably one that is actually above the clouds. So it's probably not a great example. <laughs> I should have checked that, shouldn't I? <laughs> point th point 0.2 to make it a little darker. There we go. Yeah, so it looks like I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I've picked one that is showing us something above the cloud. So I don't actually get to see a ground here. Let's go pick a different one. <laughs> so uh, pick one here. Whoops, no, not none. That's not what I meant. I meant to say um, Aristrea Rec, perhaps. Clarence Midday. Let's do that. Clarence Midday, see what that looks like. Yes, there we go. That's That looks more like a, like we've got actually got something something resembling a landscape here very good so the what you might find is when you bring this in and let's say the intensity is okay let's see what it looks like with the, with the default value here yeah it's a bit too too bright 0.3 0.3 it is let's say we're okay with uh with the fact that we're seeing a picture um you might notice that as you move around the viewport the you you essentially see that the picture on the sky dome moves as well so essentially the sky dome is fixed but we're moving the camera and that's that's kind of correct that way but if we go and zoom in and out you can see that my camera perspective seems to change if you see these little the ground in the background here you can see that change and i can see that my the distance between my camera and my sphere certainly does change but the image itself on the sky dome that doesn't change and on a landscape that might not matter all that much but if you have something that's not as uh, as large you can use something if something that's that smaller like a room or like the stonemason scene the streets of medieval that we're going to have a look at later then you might find that a little disturbing and you'd like perhaps for the hdri to also move while you move the camera and the reason essentially why this doesn't work is because there are uh, various ways to display the sky dome so i wish i could show you this in unreal engine they can actually display the sky dome it doesn't it's not a complete sphere there it's kind of a sphere with a with a squished in bottom it's kind of kind of nice and i reckon do the same thing but so this is happening because we've got this uh, at the top here under render settings under dome we've got the dome mode and that's currently set to infinite sphere so that means the the sphere that is projecting that image is literally infinitely large and it doesn't move but we can change that behavior to uh, infinite sphere with ground we've got three versions with ground and instead of infinite sphere we can say finite sphere we can also say finite box i'm going to come to that later and all these three variations exist with the ground plane and the one with the ground is a bit like what i was describing it's kind of a circle and a, and a flat bit at the bottom onto which the the image is kind of stretched so i'm going to switch this over to finite sphere and uh, you're not going to see a difference right now but there are other options now in here that we can play with so one is the dome scale multiplier and the other is the dome radius let's stick with the dome scale multiplier because it influences essentially this so if i go and change that to something 
uh, smaller, like 100 is the default. If I set this to something smaller, like 10, then you can just about see that you now see more of the landscape than you did before. So watch these mountains in the background here. We can see like kind of, you know, one, two, three-ish hills. If I go and set this back to the default of 100, we see we're kind of a little bit more zoomed in almost. So the lower this value is, the more you see from your HDRI. So it's a bit like changing the focal length, but not for your actual camera, just for how it is projected onto the onto the sky dome. And as a result, the smaller we make that, so if I make this like really small, like one, then we can see that this is actually now the sky dome, which is so small that our object is, is essentially almost larger than the sky dome. So I I'd recommend not making this smaller than five, perhaps. Let's stick with 10 for this example and move our camera again and hey, presto, so now our now the distance between the sphere and our object is smaller and as such we can detect more of a curve as well as the distance can be perceived. So if we actually do this, we do move closer to that part of the sky dome or further away. And so ideally, if this was real geometry, you would probably not have any slipping between your object and your HDRI. So maybe I'll make that a little bit smaller. And this is one of those important things. If you do work with HDRIs and you sometimes find, hey, uh, especially things like buildings versus characters, you think hey, that door looks like it's nine feet tall, but my character is tiny compared to that. And that's just that that perspective just doesn't match up. And this is how you can this is how you can correct that. This is how you can change the size of your HDRI in relation to the 3D objects that you've got in your scene. David, you know, um, that is, um, uh, yes, exactly. We're going to talk about that. <clears throat> Sorry, suffering from a little bit of a cold. Yes, so sometimes the problem that you have with HDRIs that come from uh, free sites or even the ones that you buy is that you don't exactly know how large the thing was that they were capturing. So you have to kind of make it up as you go along. So it'll be easier when you make your own HDRIs because you know what the source footage was looked like. Um, let me go and uh, show you a different HDRI, namely one that I've made myself. Let me do that. Let me do that. Let me go and switch this back to 10. And instead of this environment map that I've got from Polyhaven, oh, this is actually what it looks like when you hover over it. Uh, so HDRIs can be square. They can be um, kind of landscape two by one as well. I've made one that was landscape. And I think I have that here. We're going to create something very similar later. Uh, was it in here? Was it maybe this one? Is it? Could be. No, that's not it. Yes, no, that is it. Is it? Yes, I think that's it. <laughs> Jay, get organized, for God's sake. <laughs> there we go. So that is, oh yeah, let me go and put this back to um, this. And maybe I'll put this, it's maybe a little bit bright. So let's put that to, let's put that to here. So this is the streets of medieval by stonemason that comes as part of the michael nine uh, fantasy mega bundle it's a really really cool set we're going to have a look at it uh, but i can move so fast with it because this is a hdri that i've rendered from it and i didn't use literally anything other than just that studio i'm going to go and use the dome scale multiplier again with finite square but with finite sphere and i'm going to put that to five so then i get uh, I, I can show you some of the things that are happening when you do that as you get uh, closer to a smaller value uh, you can see that the buildings they tend to kind of bend in a little bit especially when you move it around you can see that the it's a bit like i'm filming with a fish eye lens but I'm not really doing that. So, uh, yeah, quite, quite exciting. Uh, once again, you can move uh, back and forth and it's almost as if my 3D object is in place here. So that's, that's very cool. When compared, compare that to the, uh, the uh, default, which is the infinite sphere, I'm literally stuck with this and no way to, to make that any smaller. So I'll, immediately I'm thinking, yeah, I'm a little bit too close here to the buildings and that really doesn't work with my object. So yeah, finite sphere is kind of nice. I wanted to ch also show you what happens with the 
finite box. That's another kind of mini advanced feature. If you switch that on, then your sky dome isn't exactly a uh, like a sphere it is now a cube and you get to change the dimensions of the cube down here so you've got the dome width height and depth if you have something like a rectangular indoor room that is wider than it is high and it's kind of a thin corridor then you can match these things up with the width height and depth value and the multiplier will essentially size the whole thing up that is that's kind of how that works so you can see that even though I've got my scale multiplier set to 5, my geometry seems to be very straight. So that works That works a lot better. So if I'm even going to make that uh, smaller, I can still see the geometry seems to be steady. So it's not curving in. That's that's kind of nice. You can see something else. So when you move the camera, you'll see that this, this is essentially the corner that we're looking at here. So sometimes the geometry is doing weird things because it is now a cube. And you can kind of see uh, how that works. But it's, it's one of those things, play around with that and um, see how it improves your work with HDRIs. There's a lot of other stuff that I could uh, that I could show you. One small thing I just might mention here while we're talking about this uh, is that there is um, I can see the the shadow is being drawn on the ground and that's kind of nice. This is really really important to have these contact shadows for believability. So I would I would always leave them on. You can't switch them off, but I would thoroughly recommend that you that you leave them on. I might just go and switch this back to the finite sphere here. I see now I'm I'm at three, so I can see the my dorm creeping in here. Let me go switch that back to five. There. So, um, but what happens is that uh, Ira is relatively clever and recognizes that this ground and the lowest object in the scene it kind of gets matched up. So, if I had a second sphere, let me just go and duplicate that and move that a little bit higher. Like say the second sphere. Let's go move that over here second sphere move it over here a little bit and then i'll go and just move that a little bit further up um, ira is clever enough to say well this one is the lowest object and as such i'm going to go and make sure this is the floor this other object appears to be higher and i'm going to put the i'm going to render the shadow slightly further away because that's kind of what would happen in real life so with my second sphere selected, if I'm going to go switch over to my parameters tab to my trans translations, and I'm so I'm kind of roughly like 50 centimeters above now. If I'm going to go and change this to minus 50, watch what happens. So the second sphere is now the lowest object, the lower of the two objects. And once again, Ira is clever enough to say, well, you know, that is probably where the ground needs to be. So this is, you know, the, the, the lowest point. And as such, I'm going to make that the ground plane of what I'm rendering, uh, because otherwise that would be weird. And it's trying to do this because it's helpful, but uh, that works really well. If you have one character in your scene, you have a good chance that that thing is going to be reaching the ground if you wanted to do that. But there are also uh, scenes in which you might not want that. So you may think, hey, I would really like for this to be the lowest point here but this one i'd like for that to be kind of half buried in the sand perhaps and how do we make that happen uh, we can i might just go and bring that up maybe by a little bit so i'm going to put this to minus 20 and i'm going to tell iray to not use this automation that we have here and that is happening also on the render settings tab under environment where we've just been there is a way to say on here on ground there is a way to let us have an influence of that so we have the ground position mode and that is currently set to auto so if you switch that to manual then you'll see that uh, all of a sudden the ira is saying okay i'm going to acknowledge these values here for the ground origin x y and z here this is also where you find um the, do you want the ground to be drawn do you want the ground shadow to be on so if i switch that off then there's no contact shadows which looks just you know weird so uh, if you're after realism then i thoroughly recommend you leave that on but this is also where you can tell how glossy how reflective the ground is supposed to be and what color you'd like for this to render
So now you can make adjustments here. We're on the ground origin Y. So if I wanted to uh, change this to maybe for this ball also to be sunken in a little bit, I'm going to go and switch this to maybe 20. So therefore the whole ground comes up, buries my, my bits and pieces in the, in the imaginary ground. So this is another thing to, to play around with. If you need some objects to kind of sink into the ground, contact shadows are still here, but it is like, you know, the, the objects would be sunken in now. Yes, this is where you do that. Environment set, oh, sorry, render settings, environment, ground, and then there's the ground position mode that's either set to auto, then IRA calculates the lowest part of all the objects in your scene, or you switch it to manual, and then you have full control of how that's being calculated. I'm glad I could teach you something new, Casey. <laughs> and it's so early in the morning. <laughs> There's so many little hidden gems in in how you can how you can work with HDRIs. It's just um, it's it's wonderful. And you know, I'm really not an expert on this, but there's just so many cool things to discover, which I think puts this fairly into the realm of experimentation. Oh, you got bad stuttering? Oh no, no way. Same here. Let me just have a quick look what's going on. I can see my return is uh, is complaining as well. Let me just have a quick quick nosy. What's going down? <laughs> Bear with me, everyone. We are also um, recording this, so uh, there is a safe recording in case it's, uh, it really looks bad. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having issues here as well. I'm having issues here as well. There's sadly not much I can do about it other than let it, um, let it settle down. So this is the, the thing I'm looking at, this red square here that tells me my upload speed or is kind of compromised here. I wish I could just switch to my backup on the fly, but I believe that'll, that may prematurely stop the stream. So I'd rather not do that. Let's see how it, let's see how it fares. I will keep an eye on this and I'll hope it's going to calm down in a moment. Had I known, I would have used the backup right away. <laughs> Dang. So there is a recording available that'll hopefully, you know, look, look a little bit better. Uh, what else? How do we make these HDRIs? Was there anything else about working with HDRIs? Are there any questions that I could take at this point in time while we wait for this thing to settle down? Let me have a look. My mods are very kind. They are collating your questions. So I'm going to just have a quick look if there is anything happening here. Uh, how old a generation, David? Can Genesis 1 stuff be converted to Genesis 9? To tell you the truth, yes, it can. I've tried that, and um, Genesis 1 directly to 9 is a bit of a stretch, in all honesty, only because the, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get the arms and the hands to match up. My advice is to go from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2, and then go from Genesis 2 to Genesis 9. Thankfully, I have a couple of videos on my channel in which I'm explaining how that works first with the genesis 8 character 8 to 9 and then also with all the generations 2 and 3 over to 9 and if you needed genesis 1 content then i would strongly recommend you go from 1 to 2 and then use 2 to 9 so that totally works um, my cloud vip i have no updates on the m2 chips by apple um, and they're and them working with das studio one of those things <laughs> <laughs> See, Popeye, one of those things. Can tell I'm not a streamer then. Um, was there anything else I wanted to tell you about this? I think that was... Oh, actually, yes, there was one thing. There was one thing. Let me go and put this back to auto and bring my spheres... Let's delete one of my spheres here. In fact, let's delete my other sphere as well and uh, and bring in the, well, the star of the show. I have dressed him up already, Mr. Michael Nine. Uh, if only I remember where you were. HDR demo, there we go. I've got a Victoria and a Michael that are essentially ready to go, that are posed and dressed. I'm gonna go and just load Michael into here and then we can have a look at him, what he would look like in this set. And I'll show you some things that you might wanna watch out on if you're making uh, portraits with HDRIs as a template. It might take a second, <laughs> might take a second. Yes, it's really nice, David. It's uh, it's it's really nice to do that. So it's the shapes only at the moment. And as I said, on uh, next Saturday, I'm going to explain how to deal with skin textures. It's often not all that necessary to convert 
uh, literally every detail of your old characters because newer figures tend to have the newer, better shaders. And you might find that you can probably better recreate with a new shader uh, your old shape of the character and use a new shader from the from Genesis 9. That often works a little bit better. I see uh, with all the outfits and all that. Here he is. Perfect. Hello, Michael. How's it going? And now he's like, you know, he's the he's the person who's uh, who's in charge of of all this and <laughs> casting spells that stuff. So it kind of helps if you have a character in there, you can judge, does this guy fit in here? So maybe the, the this house is still a little bit too small. If I look at the door here in relation to that, the door might need to be a little bit larger. So let's go and see if we can make that happen on the render settings tab under dome once again. I think I might uh, turn the dome scale multiplier back to 10. 10 and then hit return of course <laughs> there we go now the door kind of got larger and it fits in a little bit better with his size it could probably even be a little bit larger maybe 12 maybe 15 something like that but yeah this is you can you can gauge by background objects this how does my foreground object actually fit in with the with the rest of the hdri and then of course there is the lighting problem so sometimes you encounter things like this and you think you know what um he's getting the light from the back and we can see that by the direction of his shadows so um what newcomers often tend to do is say hey the hdr is perfect i'm just going to go and crank up the intensity to i don't know 10. just make it so that his face looks okay and michael is kind of a good example for this because he has a very dark complexion i find uh, at least with the with the default shader that he's got on there and when you do that you go and risk overexposing the rest of the image and you might get his face right don't know why this is taking so long but uh you might get his face right but uh you go and blow out the rest of the picture so maybe 10 was a little bit much um maybe eight would have been would have been kind of better or something like that so you know his face looks good but all this is so blown out that it's really that you know it doesn't really doesn't really look good and then you can say okay fine i i acknowledge that maybe i don't want to do that maybe then i'm going to go and turn the dome around and make sure that the light is actually coming from the other side and if you wanted this particular thing in the background you can also turn the figure around that's one other thing I wanted to show you how to actually do that. So it's on the render settings tab on the dome. You've got these two uh, options here that are the dome orientation. Uh, one is literally the Y orientation. Well, you have X, Y, and Z, and that's you know, X, um, X, Y, and Z. That's how that works. And the one we're really interested in is the Y orientation because that spins our dome around. We don't really want for the road to be, you know, sideways unless you're making an image in which he's climbing a hill. Maybe maybe your whole village is kind of on a hill. You could tilt that around. So that's the Y orientation that spins the globe around the, the um, sky dome. But you can also use this one here, the dome rotation. So that and that does the same thing. It's just a different numerical value for that. So if I wanted to turn this around by 180 degrees I would type in 180 and then my whole dome spins around and then the light kind of comes from the other side so if I was kind of part partial to what I saw in the background there I can just go and turn Michael 9 around so while this has worked to to make him look better than before it's still doesn't really make him look great and this is what i was kind of alluding to in the beginning that i said well uh, this part of the whole figure is still very much in the shadow and while you could find a position in which he gets the light directly from the front you're also eradicating all the moodiness and the all the all the features from him so you see this this shadow under his nose is strong and it's it's ugly so what i would strongly recommend you do is add something either like a bounce board kind of from from here or you use a mesh light or you use a spotlight and turn that into a into a mesh like a little circle or something just to brighten these things up a little bit and then as a finishing touch i would also put something behind him so that'll accentuate these things that'll separate him from uh from the background and then one final touch and then we're done with the demo uh, is that i would recommend you add a little bit of depth of field that's an important thing to consider if you add depth of field and you blur out you throw this type of the part of the background out of uh, focus a little bit it has an implication for how 
much time you need to spend to create your own HDRI to begin with. Because if you already know it's th the house isn't going to, I won't see all the features of the house. I'm going to go and blur this out anyway. You know that you can probably get away with a thousand by two thousand HDRI when you render it. You don't have to render it out at something like four thousand by eight thousand. And you don't have to render it with all that many iterations. So that, again, that speeds up your workflow. I just wanted to bring that to your attention because that's a that's an important it's an important part uh, to consider. I want to show you one other thing that you can do with HDRIs, and for that, I'm going to uh, load in a different one, which comes, I believe, as part of the Rocky Mountains backyard. That actually comes with. A whole scene. I'm going to go and load that. I'll leave Michael in here. He's a good. He's a good demo person. Here, perfect. It comes with its own HDRI. That is actually a product, Brian. If you can find that on the desk store, the Rocky Mountains backyard. Takes a second to calculate. Buffering has stopped, which is very nice. So, and um, this is a little uh, kind of a little cabin, and we have an afternoon type scene. The the little um, set is set into uh, rock and in the background we have a HDRI which is relatively low res and it mainly serves to show us the lighting so that we get this kind of moody afternoon type lighting in there. But I'll see something else and this is this is important if you ever wanted to show part of the HDRI. So it doesn't it doesn't move that's that's fine it's, it's far away we're okay with that. Um, you can see it's not very high res. You can literally see the steps here. If you needed to show this as part of something that happens outside the window and this is noticeable for you, you think, yeah, I wish this would be blurred out a little bit. There is a thing under the render settings here that lets you, in fact, do that. I'll go switch this over to Irene because filament doesn't show this. It is the environment lighting blur over here. That is something you can enable and that will just apply a little bit of Gaussian blur to your HDRI. So let me just see if I can find something where it's really noticeable. Kind of here, you can see, I hope this is coming out in the stream, these little steps here. If you switch that on, then it gets blurred. And that sometimes, especially when you have this slightly out of focus anyway, that'll look a little bit better than um, than it being off. So with it on, it kind of just blurs it out a little bit and with it off. So just in case you have a low-ish resolution HDRI, which this is, and this is why this is such a good example, switch this on and then, you know, it'll blend in perfectly with your own depth of field. <laughs> nice view, isn't it, Popeye? I thought so too. I thought so too. <laughs> Very cool. One other thing, just wanted to bring it to your attention, just so that you know it's there, and I'm sure you know already, it's the environment lighting resolution over here. So the resolution is essentially the the definition of the of the sky dome. So 512 is the default, and it's ample and plenty for most of the things that you do. If you set this to lower, it's like you're you're decimating your sky dome, and you're having you know less less points from which light is calculated, if I understand this correctly. And likewise, if you wanted to have more points of your HDRI calculate super accurate light bounces, you would set this up. So sometimes um, we set this to four or five thousand, like basically multiplied by ten. Um, I don't see that much of a difference, to be really honest, because for lighting, especially for low res HDRIs, it's, it's perfectly fine to leave it on 512. But your mileage may vary, and I thought I'll bring it to your attention. Alrighty, I think that was all I wanted to talk about in regards to working with HDRIs. Let's see how we could, you know, create our own from scratch. I'll show you the easy jaw drop method first because it's all, it comes as part of Das Studio, which is just so, so cool. So I'm going to go and start with a brand new scene. And I might actually, in a moment, uh, load up a second instance of Das Studio so that I can show you uh, what comes out of this and then how we apply it in a fresh version of Das Studio in another instance, if my computer is okay with that. <laughs> Let's hope he is. So I'm going to use another item from the Michael 9 uh, Fantasy Mega Bundle, which is the wonderful new set by Stonemason here. This is a small 
part of it that you've already seen in the HDR that I've made. Uh, Michael Nine, wonderful to see him so uh, close behind Victoria Nine. I'm really, really in love with her. She's a wonderful character and it's so, so nice that she has a male companion now. And the Mega Bundle comes with three outfits, I believe. It comes with two hairs. This is the Marty Main. That's the one I was using. Uh, this is the second outfit. This is, uh, this is nice. It looks really cool when it's rendered, like proper leather and all that. It comes with uh, some poses. This is another outfit here, kind of a he, he can be both your medieval hero as well as your sci-fi cyberpunk hero. Comes with a nice lovely um, exterior slash interior environment. Comes with two sets of expressions, I believe. Very, very cool. This is the bus cut. This is the second um, hair item that it that it comes with. But you can also get him in, uh, in two smaller bundles. So I think the mega bundles are the ones where you get literally every item. But if you were to go down here to Michael 9, then you go and see that he, this is this is a man. This is a man, the new Michael. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> Loving the expression. Very fashionable, buddy. Very fashionable. <laughs> and he is down here. He is in the intro bundle as well as the action bundle. So essentially the intro bundle plus the action bundle make up the fantasy mega bundle. Just in case you ever see these descriptions, that's how that is. If you, uh, if you don't want to buy all the items in the mega bundle, you can either focus on something medieval or something uh, sci-fi. So it kind of, you know, depends on what you want to, what you want to do. But um, one of the things that I'm dealing with is this one, the streets of medieval. And Stonemason has been <laughs> been at it again. I was already in love with Wonderland and now we're traveling to a completely different time, which is this. So it's it's you know these look way more detailed than the HDRI that I rendered out. Uh, but we're gonna load this in. It is kind of a medium heavy set. There's a lot of detail here, even though the geometry is relatively low res considering the amount of detail that's in here. And he also has two uh, lighting sets that are made with the sun and sky option uh, through iRay. Very, very nice. Hazy type effects here. So very, very cool. But um, the trouble with rendering stories in these types of things is that it's really, th this thing by itself is already super heavy. I mean, look at all the foliage here. Very cool. This thing by itself is already very heavy. So if you then go and put two characters in and you want to change their expressions, it's it's not very comfortable um, working like that. And this is really where uh, HDRIs come in. Look at that. This is, you can see some of the geometry here, some of the topology, and that is fairly low compared to uh, considering the amount of detail that's in here. So another top release though, Mason, I don't know how you do it. One day we should sit down in case you're watching this. One day we should sit down and talk about your workflow. I'm really, really excited and interested in how you do it from concept to uh, to working, what tools you work with and uh, and also how you then how you then turn it into a product for Dash Studio. We find this thing under environments. Here it is, the streets of medieval. And it comes in under environments. It comes in as a set. So that's a scene subset. It also comes in with cameras. Uh, they, all these props are separate. So if you wanted to build your own village from these things, you can make that happen. And it comes in with two types of uh, render settings here. For those to work, by the way, you need to have an environment options and a tone mapper node in here. If you have a completely empty scene and you load this in, what would happen is that a scene subset adds itself to whatever's in the scene right now. So it's not a scene, it's a scene subset, thereby, therefore, not overwriting any of these things that you have in your scene right now. If you were to, if I didn't have that, I'll just go and remove environment options and tone mapper. And this is usually what it looks like. Uh, you might not even have a filament draw options node. I have that to, so that my lighting doesn't look blown out, kind of in my default scene. If you were to load in the render settings now, nothing would happen. So let me go and demonstrate that. You double click that, nothing happens. And that's because these things get applied to the environment options and or tone mapper options, depending on what's set up. In order to make that happen, you can either switch your viewport over to iRay, in which case those two things will be generated for you automatically. Or you head over to create environment options node, bring one in like so, and create a tone mapper node as well. You can do that too. Then you don't have to switch to iRay and wait for this thing to happen. And now, if I go and 
bring in the first render settings in. Now you see lighting changes, and it's because these settings can now be applied to these two nodes here. Just an aside, just an aside. So I'm going to go and uh, zoom out, select the group that all of this is in, Control F to get a little bit of a bird's eye view of the scene. And we can wander through this as well. That is cool. But if you make a HDRI, then I would suggest you consider where you want the action to take place. And um, we're going to create a spherical camera in a moment that will that will be responsible for rendering essentially what could be projected onto a sky dome at a later point. So we're going to put something like an imaginary silver ball in our scene that captures at that point what a sky dome might look like. And once we render that out, we go and take that image and apply it to our real sky dome, getting rid of all this geometry and then using the sky dome as our background. So as such, you need to put that camera the spherical camera where you imagine your characters to be. If you already have characters in your scene and you just want to replace the geometry with a HDRI, then uh, you already have a reference point. I don't, but I'm just looking through this here that perhaps I don't want to. So I guess what I'm what I'm what I want to tell you is this is not where I want my HDRI to get rendered unless this is where I want the scene to take place. That isn't what what this um, scene is made for. I would imagine this is where we may have a conversation or this or even here or we may have one here uh, or here uh, or maybe even here. don't know. These are kind of background images or so the background buildings here. So I think we wouldn't have it here. We would probably either have it here or here or here, something along those lines. Um, so that is where your spherical camera is that will capture all that data. So I might just put it here, directly here. And to do that, I'll go and create a regular camera. And usually I would use the apply active viewport transforms here, but that'll create a duplicate of what I'm currently seeing with my perspective view. So I'm thinking of just applying the default settings and that'll create a camera that kind of looks in from the side onto the center of my scene at a slight angle. This is not exactly where I wanted it to be. So I'll move this over to where I'm thinking the action is going to take place. Let's say, let's say here. Is that a good spot? I can't tell. Maybe. Or maybe here. I think this is kind of where I had mine before. Maybe we'll put it here. I'll we'll put it here. So imagine this is where one or both of your characters are, and that's where your camera needs to be to render a HDRI from this position. So a spherical camera is a bit is a little bit weird to describe, and it can only be previewed in iRay. So with the camera selected and the parameters tab um, open here, under rotation, you want to make sure this is um, zeroed out. So currently, if I look at my camera, I can see that it's, whoops, <laughs> I can see that it's kind of pointing down a little bit and it's kind of, you know, pointing, it's maybe at an angle and I don't really want to do that. The Z rotate is kind of at zero. The X rotate is at minus 14. So I'm going to go and uh, zero that out by just alt left clicking on that or typing in zero. And the Y rotate isn't the Y rotate you can, you can leave. I, I, I would, I would suggest you zero it out as well, but it doesn't matter all that much. It's, it's nice to give us a preview of the lighting. See if that works okay for the HDRI. You can put this to something like uh, minus 180. So then that it would point the other way. And we'll see what it looks like with literally with, with, uh, with zero. Let's go do that. If we go look through the camera now, it's it's very unspectacular. It just looks at this. Oh, there's one other thing that we need to consider how far it is from the ground. So that'll depend on what types of shots you're planning to do with that HDRI. So um, usually I imagine I'm the I'm the photographer with the top-down viewfinder camera with one of those old style TLRs that I would kind of have at belly height, so about a meter, meter twenty above the ground. So under translation, we're uh, 190 above ground, so almost two meters. That's almost six feet, and that's a little high. So I think uh, 100 is probably good. 
X and Z, leave that alone because that's the, that, um, that's the position in your scene. But the Y translates literally the height from, you know, from where you are. But if you're shooting something, if your dog is a, or a cat is a main subject, they're much, they're much lower. So at that point, you probably make that more like, you know, 20 or 30. And then you see that the horizon line is kind of lower. For people and portraits, I'd say make it a hundred. Uh, same for landscapes. So a hundred is a good, it's a good thing to, good thing to keep in mind here. Let me go switch this over to iRay now and uh, show you what this spherical camera thing uh, looks like in a moment. It takes a second to cook. Absolutely. Heavy scenes like this, you're glad you have Scene Optimizer. I totally agree. Yes, that it really comes in handy because then, you know, you've got, you've got that, all those textures, all that geometry. And then you have the Victoria and your Michael in the scene and, you know, maybe some other, you know, like the, like the Deforce cat and all that. And yeah, all of a sudden you're out of, you're out of view. I and mean, this is also where HDRIs really, really help. So it's difficult for me to see, is this properly exposed? So it, it probably is, but let me just go turn my camera around by 180. Just look at, look at my backside. It looks like I'm seeing um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing things. Okay. I think I can also go to my perspective view to just go and, um, and get a bird's eye view of my shot here and just to see uh, is this the kind of lighting mood that i want because we're kind of baking this in uh, into the hdri so it looks okay it's kind of an afternoony type thing but if you wanted to make any changes to the light now's the time to do it perhaps so storm mason has done this uh, with the environment dome here with the uh, sun and sky i believe yes we don't have a hdri and sun and sky is over here it has its own section so it's the 10th of march 2015 at 7 50 in the morning if you want the shadows uh not to be quite that uh, that um that large perhaps we're going to make it 11 50 and then you know we have a different kind of a different light mood here so change it to whatever you think works for your scene maybe uh that was uh was, was that that was i was going to say 3 p.m what does that look like this is what that looks like. So shadows going the other way, but I'm going to go and leave it like Stone Mason had it here on uh, 1150. 150 also doesn't look bad. We could do that. <laughs> not not as moody, not as dark. What do you reckon? Maybe it's uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's 250. Maybe it's maybe it's 150. Maybe it's 150. Let me do that. Let me do that. But so what I'm mainly looking at is, is this overexposed or not? Or is this underexposed? But it isn't. So that's that's kind of good. I can see details in the shadows. Nothing appears to be um, overexposed. There's also, um, we don't uh, see the... Yeah, okay, cool. That's fine. That's cool. Um, we could bring our own HDRI in to render this if we wanted to have clouds. That is another possibility. We could make that happen. I'm going to dispense with it. I'm going to just leave it as it is so that we have, you know, good lighting. What I'm essentially looking at is that it isn't uh, something like, you know, that it doesn't look like that. This is not the HDRI quality that I'm looking for. Uh, similarly, um, that is also not something that I'd like to render out. I'd, I'd like to uh, make sure the lighting is as it would be, like my base lighting for the scene is already in place and it looks like it is so i'm going to go and render this as it is so let me go switch to my camera here look through it and that looks very unspectacular but let's go and switch this over under the parameters tab over on the lens section here let's switch this over from the lens distortion type none which is a regular um, lens on a camera, like a canonical lens, as they call it, and switch this over to spherical lens. And when I do that, then you'll see that all of a sudden it renders from all angles. And you can only see this when you've switched your viewport into iRay. So if you switch this back to filament or the texture shaded view, you don't see any changes at all. You only see this in the preview and when you hit render. You can render it out square, but most HDRIs actually rendered out in an aspect ratio of one by two, like very landscapey. So I'm going to go and set up my, whoops, <laughs> I'm going to set up my, 
aspect ratio like that just when I restart that studio, which has decided to crash. That is a shame, isn't it? Good thing Jay saved the scene. Oh, no, he hasn't. What a shame. <laughs> Adding Omniverse real-time render in DAS would be a game-changer. Popeye wouldn't adjust. Absolutely. Ah, uh, that's a shame. One of those things. Let's go load it in again. <laughs> hey, it's good practice. Good practice. Under environments, we're going to go with the streets of medieval. Boom, perfect. <laughs> Dang! Hey, that's good. It means I can pour myself another cup of coffee. <laughs> Also, have a look at the chat. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go and do... Uh, I'm just going to go and eyeball it to where it was a minute ago. I'm just going to go drive there. To kind of here. It doesn't have to be super exact. I just want to stay away from things like being too close to a wall. That's why I'm, I'm looking for places where I'm a little bit away from things because if you're rendering the HDRI too close to a wall, it'll look really weird having a wall right in your face. So this is probably going to be enough. I'm going to go and create a new camera. And this time I will use the perspective view because I know what's kind of this, this area-ish here with the camera uh, selected. I see this is some getting into the... I'm a little bit too close to the tree, aren't I? Oh yes, it's a little bit too far, uh, too far back here. So let's go and do this again. Let's put it here, like right in the right in the center here. So this is where it was before. This is not where I wanted to have. This is this is kind of good here. And with that, kind of good practice here. Uh, under rotation, I want to render, I want to um, zero this out, all of these, uh, just so that it, the, the HDRI isn't on an angle, rendered on an angle. Then the translation, I'm going to go and put this to 100 above the ground, like we said. And now under lens type, I'm going to go and change this from lens distortion type none to spherical. Feel free to try many of the others that come uh, with that studios and we'll, we'll use spherical. And if we go and look through that, we have that. And of course, Jay is now clever enough and he's going to totally save his scene. <laughs> hey, Daja, how's it going? Good to see you. Yes, thank you, Brian. Thank you. I'm going to call this um, Streets of Med, perhaps as a whole scene. And I haven't changed the aspect ratio yet either, which we will do uh, before we were so rudely, rudely interrupted. Save often, folks. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> very, very important. It is actually a good, a good idea, David. Yeah, save before you switch viewports over to something like IRA, before you hit Control R, uh, just save. Especially if you've already had a scene save, Control S really isren't that big a deal. So under general, I'm going to go and switch this over to a two by one aspect ratio. Um, if you wanted to see a lot of detail, you would probably do something like 8,000 wide by 4,000 um, high. But because we don't really need that much detail, I'm going to do something uh, much simpler, much smaller. I'm going to try 2000 by 1000. And for the only purpose is that it's just going to render so much faster. I'm going to go and constrain the proportions here. Switch on my aspect frame. And this is, yeah, this is kind of what I'm, this is the, the thing that I want to render out. While we're here, let's have a look at the render settings. Uh, you can make it, you can let it render as long as you want and make it as high res as you want. Again, I'm not going to do that. I'm I'm thinking 100 max samples is probably enough. Rendering quality, I'll disable. Everything else is at the default. And the only other thing I'm going to do is I'll switch on the denoiser here with uh, post denoiser on, and then this needs to also be set to on. And then we're denoising that as well. Uh, that should be good. Control S. I think we've decided that a little bit of an... No, I'm going to use the defaults, actually. I'm going to use the defaults. And also, yeah, very important. <laughs> um, bring in Stonemason's render settings, which may actually change what I've just added there. So let me go and save my render settings out, just so that we know how that works. And so HDRI render low res. 
and everything will be will be added here perfect it's just because and you will see what happens if i go and load storm mason's preset in now the lighting is going to change but also some of the render settings will be affected um like uh like you know the max samples and, and the aspect ratio and all that so i'm just going to go and overwrite that with with mine was that, is that a good idea no because then i'm going to undo that no okay forget it i'm going to go and set it up again as i said 100 samples is good for me render quality off i'll use the pick that's cool but i'll switch my denoza on goodie and dimensions are still the same perfect okay good stuff so now i'm going to go and save this you do Dalja. i'm really really glad to hear that i'm really glad to hear that snurling there's a lot of misconception about the denoiser i think most people assume it ruins my skins it just makes everything look terrible not the case it's it's also not the one click everything is magic and super fast immediately option so the the truth is you still need to render a long time for all the detail to come out but the denoiser can help eliminate any noise as you render so if you if you're like if you're Good render settings would take like say you know 20 minutes to render a good picture out then you can't switch on the denoiser do the same thing with five minutes and then say now my picture looks rubbish and it's the denoiser's fault that isn't the case but after 20 minutes you might still have small bits of noise in there so if you render 20 minutes with the denoiser then those bits of grain are gone um, but i can also very much see the other side of the coin that people prefer not to use the built-in denoiser in iray and say hey i'm going to do this with um with the topaz ai product and let it take care of the denoising afterwards so then i have best of both worlds i've got the render that's finished i don't need to re-render that in case i'm not happy with the built-in iray denoiser or you can use the free standalone optics denoiser that you can also use on any picture no matter if it's a render or a photograph so i can see you know i can see best of i can i can see both both, both camps i'm a big fan of the denoiser because it's just one less step and less thing for me to worry about i've saved it let me go and switch this over to iray and let's have a look at our spherical image before we render it out because there's another step that i need to tell you about so that we can turn this into a hdri directly out of das studio aha there we go we see everything we see some detail in the shadows here we also see this is the lightest part of the picture but nothing seems to burn out so that's good i'm i'm kind of happy with with the tonal range that i'm seeing and it's kind of funny to to just look at this what our camera kind of looked at if it were a canonical camera which is literally this part here versus what the spherical camera sees which is behind at the above below so kind of nice um just one note on the height of the camera. If you were to move that under general transforms here, uh, if you were to move that up or down, you see a small change. So if I make this 200 now, you see that, um, you know, it is it is moving up. So if I do make that, make that like, you know, extreme, like 2000 now, you can see that this is what would happen to my picture. So the horizon line is now here and it's it, this this isn't going to work. But if you were to render something, you know, with 300, you think, hey, that looks like a, you know, spherical image. But the moment you bring this in to uh, into Das Studio and use it as a HDRI or Blender or any of the other 3D applications, by the way, you'll see that if you bring in the third sky, you'll see that that this bit here is literally the horizon line. And if you if that moves up or down, that'll dictate how far up or down your shot looks like. So if I'm imagining myself once again with a T with a TLR looking from the from the top down viewfinder, I think hundred is, is probably good. It's kind of the the horizon line is uh, it's not so much exactly in the middle, but I'm a little bit lower than that. That's kind of my point that I'm trying to make. Sorry, I keep waffling on so much. <laughs> this is exciting though. So with my framing correct, there's one other thing I need to do before I hit render. And that is we need to tell iRay that we actually want to render out a HDRI. So that is to say, I don't want to render out a regular image. I want to use this as a HDRI later. And um, 
that brings us on to another point that I may have to explain in Photoshop. A regular image that we would get out if I hit Control R now, that would be a JPEG or PNG or a TIFF or something like that. And most of these are 8-bit images. And that means that both the, the all three, the red, green, and the blue, as well as the alpha channel, they have eight bits worth of information per color channel. So that's um, was eight bit against 256 tonal values, isn't it? That's that's what it is in the red, green, and blue channel. So combine that, you have a possible 16.7 million colors per pixel, which is kind of cool considering our eye can only see about 10 million. Um, but the this this sort of an 8-bit image can hold 16.7 million colors, which is you know which is nice. Um, most another interesting tidbit of information: CRTs, old CRT monitors, they could show that, but most cheap LCD and LED screens they can't. Like the you know $150 27-inch monitors, they can't even show that. So this is sometimes why you think, hey, what what's wrong with my image? You you might see some kind of you know posterization effects. It might just be your monitor. Um, but it is relatively limited, especially if it comes to baking in the kind of information that we want to have, which is like extreme amounts of tonal range. And this is where we need to make a 32-bit image that has not 8, not 16, but 32 bits per channel of information that can be stored. And uh, while 8-bit and 16-bit uh, images are essentially 16-bit is twice as much tonal range, but it's the same color spectrum. 32-bit is like literally billions of values that you could store. And they've decided to uh, expand the range of what can be stored. So more luminance values can be stored, like more exposure values can be stored. And this is basically what a HDRI uh, looks like, what a HDR image looks like. It's a 32-bit image. And in DAS Studio, we need to tell iRay to render one out. We do that with something called canvases. They're DAS Studio's or iRay's multi-pass rendering system. And you'll find that under Render Settings, under the Advanced tab, the one we're all afraid of to click here. Uh, there's three tabs here, the hardware tab. This is kind of, you know, with what, what hardware you're rendering. There's the bridge tab, which is, you know, the thing that you would connect to something like Boost for DAS. And then there's canvases here. And canvases, we just need to enable them. And then we need to add one canvas to it. So this means it'll now go and do additional steps that I'll explain as it goes and renders. If you hit the plus button here, it'll come up with something called beauty. Uh, this is the canvas we're rendering, but we can change its type down here. And we're going to change this from beauty to environment lighting. And that is pretty much all we need to do. And now it'll render the normal render, the JPEG or the PNG, whatever we want to save, as well as a new EXR image that'll be saved after our render is done. Let's go and do that. And then we'll talk a little bit more about um, why that is important and uh, also why this process as it is doesn't work with all scenes. Let's see if it works. Looks promising. And as I said, you can make this as high res as you want. You can make this as large as you want. So the larger, the better. The longer you let it render, the better. But if you're if your intention is to blur this out uh, later on anyway, then it doesn't really matter how much detail it has. So it's mainly there for the lighting and for the HDR. Look, this only took, this took less than a minute. So this is, uh, this is nice. I'm going to go and save this out as a PNG here. So this is not the HDR that we're, that we're saving out. I'm going to call that Medieval V1. Save. And notice what happens. There's another dialogue that doesn't immediately go away. And if you have a really large image, it goes and takes um, takes a while to um, to go away. So here we have two things that go together. We have the we have the actual render that's just come out. So if I open that, it just looks like um, like like this, like we've seen in Das Studio. That's cool. But we also have the folder here. And in the folder, this is where canvases are saved. And uh, this is one render pass that has come out. It has a bit of a crazy name. So medieval v1 canvas environment lighting.exr. I'm going to leave this in place for now. If you had multiple canvases or multiple passes, then you'd have multiple files in here. And this is essentially the thing that is our HDRI ready to rock. 
to be used inside their studio. So it's very, very exciting. I'm going to go and um, open up a new instance of DAS Studio so I can show you this. Do you know, Nate, the thing is, I have reset it just before the stream. I'm super disappointed. <laughs> I'm super disappointed. Quarter past five. Come on, get on with Jay. So here's my second instance of DAS Studio. I might just go for demo purposes. I'm going to go bring in my, my primitive again, my trusty friend here. And I'm going to go and put a metal shader on it as well, just so that we can that we can see if and how this works. Platinum is good. Cobalt is also excellent. Perfect. Let's do that. So then under render settings, just like I've shown you before, we don't have an environment options tab in here. So uh, if I were to switch this over to iRay, then I get both of them, Tone Mapper and Environment Options, and I see my Ruins image in here. That's the one from DAS Studio. So I'll go and open up the one that we've just made that's on the desktop, which is Medieval V1 Canvases. That's the one, add that in here. Give DAS Studio a second, and we see, well, it's, uh, it's a little bit light, isn't it? So if I go and hover over that, it's just white. That's not what we want, is it? Um, and it turns out that the, that all the information is in there, but it's just we just need to adjust the brightness. It turns out that we need to adjust the brightness by a factor of a thousand. So if I go and type in here, just go to the end of the number and say divide it by one thousand. See what happens. All of a sudden, we see something of an image creeping in here. I'll go and draw the dome as well, so we can see that. Yes, almost. So maybe a thousand wasn't enough. Let's let's make it ten thousand. So divide by ten again, and there we go. We have our HDRI, and that might still be a little bit bright. So I might just go and put this to one. There we go. I think now we have exactly the the tonal. The tonal values that we that we wanted here it is a little blurry because it wasn't large enough so we can go ahead and render this out to uh, make this larger then we'd see more detail like the one that i've shown you uh, in the beginning but yeah that's essentially the the kind of the whole secret so what i tend to do is uh, set this to one this value here under environment map set this to one and then just type in at the end of it here divided by ten thousand, and then we have the correct value so now, by doing that, this is what I meant in the beginning when you have these two sliders. This can be your overall adjustment to make this thing work okay. And now if you wanted to make additional adjustments, you can use this value. So if now if you think, yeah, maybe I wanted to make this 1.2 perhaps, or maybe I want to make this like 3, then you can use this slider. You've got smaller numbers to deal with. Let me make this 0.5 because it's kind of afternoon or whatever. So very nice. And then, of course, um, once again, if we wanted to make this a bit uh, further away, we can head over to Dome, Finite Sphere will say, uh, well, Infinite Sphere will switch to Finite Sphere, and then we'll say something like Dome Multiplier, we'll set that to 10, or to maybe to 5. And we're rocking. HDRI took us less than a minute literally to render this out. If you needed a higher res version, just make it like 4,000 by 8,000 or, you know, um, 2,000 by 4,000. That'll, that'll work. Very nice. All the benefits of the scene. So, um, if you're not comfortable with adjusting this value here, and if you think, hey, what happens if I wanted to sell this image? I mean, I can't give people a completely white image, really. If I wanted to make that available, if I wanted to share this with people, this, I'm, I'm really, I, I think this is like weird. I'm, I, I don't want to do this. Uh, I have news for you. Since we're, we're doing, we're doing this translation here on import, we could also do that on the immediate render with the same effect. So it's kind of nice that I've got the, I've got this open still here. Let me go and uh, render this again. But this time, um, make it a little bit bigger. So I'll maybe make that 4,000 by 2,000. So we get a little bit more detail in. And I can use kind of the same logic as before. I can go and uh, drop down my environment intensity while I'm rendering this. So if I divide by 10,000 immediately on the render, 10,000, then I see nothing. That's okay if I go and uh, 
and uh, should I save this again? Yeah, I think I, I think I should. I think I'll just oversave that. If I go and render this out again, my PNG that comes out looks looks terrible. But if I look at my HDRI and apply that, I don't need that translation value, which is um, which is good news. So if you if you don't have Photoshop and you just want to use uh, Dash Studio to make HDRIs, this is the way to do it. Um, yeah, look at that. It's almost we we see we see barely anything, <laughs> but that's okay. I'll let it finish and then we'll have a look at the HDRI. It's kind of cool. Snellen, I'm going to explain a little bit about that uh, later. Um, that is also possible. So uh, this is a great way if you wanted to use Das Studio to make yours. But if you wanted to uh, use photographs either from your phone or maybe even from Google Street View or even from Midjourney, you can also do that uh, by stitching multiple exposures together in Photoshop. So I'm going to come to that in a moment uh, because this there's there's a downside to using doing exactly this uh, and that is of course that we don't exactly have a lot of influence over um, over how a scene uh, how a scene can be manipulated so I'll I'll go and call this one here v2 and we'll let that settle it takes a little bit longer to save my other instance of Dash Studio. I'm going to set these two values back to zero and uh, replace this one with, with the V2. That's that one. So it's a little bit larger now. It takes a moment to process. But already I can see that there's a picture looking at me now. And if we give this a moment... So this is now something I can use. The default value of two. So I would suggest you put that to one. If I put this there, there we go. If I put this to NVIDIA IRA, and now I see an actual picture. So I've done the the kind of the, the level adjustment on the render, and now it's it's almost ready to rock. So it's it's this is still set to two. So I, I think you know if we set this to one, then we have we have a good result, and it looks a little bit more high res already, and that's perfect. So everything I've explained before in regards to working with your working with HDRI still applies and it's now a fully fledged thing that you can do anything you want with. Maybe you find a box in this case just for the just for sake of the of the geometry it really makes really does make sense. Is that cool or what? You only need that studio. All you need to do is enable canvases, make it the environment lighting pass, uh, fiddle with the levels by 10,000 and, and then you're good to go. That's very cool. Oh, that script. Yes, yes, I remember. I remember what you mean. There was there used to be a script. Rob from Das had a script that could be. It's literally a thing that you could run uh, from from your content library and just double click it, and that would open up a second instance of this version of Das Studio. I don't think if I have that still, but yes, that article explains it. I don't know if that still works. I ha I've heard that in Das Studio 4.20, that functionality has been disabled. I'm not sure why. So the way I do it is by just using multiple instances of Das Studio that I have installed. So I have multiple versions. I still have 4.20. That's the release version here. This is the beta version, the public beta, which is currently the same as the publishing build that we get access to. But you can also, if you have, if you keep your installers, I have another 4.20. 16 version here that is um, that just that's just unzipped in a folder uh, on my hard drive and I could also go and um, you know and, and open that so it's it's worth having various versions what was cool about the script was that you know it's exactly the same version you're starting again on your computer so you don't have like in my case if this and that version would be different or this and that version definitely is different then this IRA version might be different to that and they might you know not work well with one another so HDRI directly from Das Studio is very cool so there is a downside to using this method and I'll show you what that is and um, I might even demonstrate that or I could just tell you um, this lighting is mainly done with the environment tab here so with the sun and sky it could also be a hdri that's loaded to light a master scene here so you know 
if it's done like that, you'll have a good chance that your HDRI rendered with canvases will work really well. But if a scene relies heavily on tone mapping to add effects, then we're having a problem because tone mapping is a second step in the rendering process. So um, under the hood, iRay can produce a 32-bit image, a 32-bit HDRI, because it has all the information that is necessary to um, to to make that happen. So you can think of it, you can think of the render process as um, a raw camera image that your professional digital camera would shoot the moment you read the data from the CMOS sensor that comes out. But that isn't a picture yet. That is just a bunch of data that is probably a lot more than you would need to create a JPEG out of it. So tone mapping is the process of turning that raw data into a viewable image. And as such, it discards a lot of stuff. Furthermore, it's 8-bit. I believe this is 8-bit. I don't think it's a 16-bit. But it'll essentially apply um, stuff with these things, like you know exposure values and shutter speed, uh, vignetting and all that. That'll be applied uh, after the rendering step. And as such, the larger dynamic range is being translated into a smaller tonal range. And that becomes your JPEG or your PNG image. So what I'm saying is anything that happens as a result of this isn't part of the HDRI. And maybe I will show you this with another stonemason set. That is Wonderland. That's the one he's released previously. And this is this is actually a great, uh, great little demo. We do exactly the same. We go and, in fact, leave our camera and just go and remove the, the whole... The whole bits and pieces are just load in Wonderland. It's also set, and then we're going to apply these render settings, and we'll have a look at um, what the beautiful effects look like and what the resulting HDRI looks like when we bring it out in this um, in this way. And then I'll show you uh, how to how to deal with that using Photoshop. So if you have sets that rely on tone mapping, you can't use the step that I've just shown you, is what I'm trying to say. And at that point, we need to go and create regular renders. They're also spherical, but we're going to make either three or five, depending on how much time you want to invest, um, and deliberately increase and decrease the exposure on those. Let's go and, render, let's go and do the render settings here. And I can already see my filament draw options node, even with my uh, with my optimizations. It looks like it's blurring this out a lot. So I have to turn down my my environment translation just so that uh, you know this comes out. Let me go and bring this to back to my perspective view. I don't really know where we're going to put the where we're going to put the camera. Just as a demo, it's more important to see. It's more important to see how the how the colors uh, come out. So this is just filament here. I'll switch this over to to iRay as soon as I found a good place. Yeah, I don't want to be in the middle of the water, but I might be. I might, I might go here. This might be a good, a good place for our, for our new spherical camera. Let's say, let's say this, this is maybe where my, where my character wants to be. So I'll go and create a new camera here. It's a little close to the wall behind me, but I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. So camera two, this is. Once again, I'll go under the lens setting of my camera and change this from. I'll leave, I'll leave it, I'll leave it like, like it is. Uh, rotation. I want to go and uh, do that. Just to check exposure, I'm going to exposure. I'm going to put this to two to seven twenty. So I'm just going to look at that translation. Uh, we said one meter above ground, like so. And let's go and save this as Wonderland. Wonderland HDRI, perfect. 
It's a wonderful set. It's a beautiful set. I believe he's been uh, he's been playing uh, stray, as as given away by the by the cat image there. <laughs> yes, there we go. So if I go, it's still saving. It's still saving. Perfect. If I go switch this over to iRay, this is my my new camera that's not switched over to um, to spherical yet. Let's just have a quick look at what the what the light effects look like. They're a beautiful, colorful night scene with um, with these values. Hey, that's that's nice, four thousand by two thousand. Uh, I'm gonna go and change this back to a hundred uh, pixels here. Without that and filtering, I'm gonna go and enable the post denoiser, and boom, perfect. So, yeah, this is this is what it looks like. Uh, it's nice. It's really nice. On the on the tone mapping tab, I can see that he's uh, he's used the exposure values and the shutter speed to get these effects, and these deviate from uh, from the norm. If I just this is like nine ten. If I go and bring that back to the default, uh, this is what it looks like. So I'll go and bring this back to here, and I'll use essentially the same steps I've used for my previous one, and I don't think it's going to work. And this is kind of the point I'm trying to make. So first of all, uh, camera, dimensions, no lens. Let's go change this over to spherical. Then that is what I see. Also very cool. And that is really all I need, right? Oh, no, 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 it's not. We need to go and switch canvases on if we haven't already. No, we haven't. So under render settings, under canvases, we go and enable that. And then here we need to just go and Add one and switch that to environment lighting. And that is all. Let it render with camera two. Why do you go all through all this render stuff when you just take a screenshot of the whole thing? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes. Some people they just they just don't understand, do they? They just don't understand. So true. Yeah, so already I'm seeing that um, it's just not quite coming out. It's probably also because I've got the, I've got my uh, environment intensity not quite set as I should have done. I think I've still set that to the ten thousandths of what we need. We'll check that in a moment. But this isn't what I'm seeing on the regular render, which is you know, uh, which is a shame. Wonderland V1, I'll call it. Just save. I'll just I'll just go check that again, and you know, editor environment. Oh no, that looks that looks that looks all good. It's done with sun and sky, so we don't have HDRI here. But weirdly, if I go and just switch this over to iRay and render this without canvases, then it looks uh, it looks completely different. So I'm a little puzzled by that. Um, and I have a feeling it is the tone mapping that is being applied that, that brings these funky effects out here. So as a result then, if I use my second instance of DAS Studio and use my Render Settings tab to bring in the HDRI we've just rendered out from Wonderland. And yes, it is an absolutely beautiful scene. It's a really beautiful set, Mick. It's really nice. Give that a second. <laughs> Do you know it's like this, you know, make art button that we've all that we've all been wishing for for such a long time. Mid journey is this close, you know. Aha, there we go. Groovy. Let's go switch this over to iRay. And while it is a HDRI, maybe it's a little it's a little blown out. So maybe we'll go divide by by ten, perhaps. None of the funky funky colorful effects are there so i don't see any of them which is such a shame so uh, either i'm doing something wrong uh, or it's there's something else that needs to be added there on the canvas's front it's kind of you know it's it's almost like somebody switched off switched off the power here in wonderland and that is that's not the hdri that i want um, but i think i will i will leave the the actual um the actual camera position in place because I think that is something that 
that I'm okay with. As you can see, the you can see the um, uh, finite box here. This is where that geometry <laughs> kind of does its thing. So I'll switch that over to finite sphere if you if you fancy something else. So let me go and show you the last half hour how we can stitch a HDRI together that will that will look like what we're looking for without the canvas option in DAS Studio. Go back to this. And so I think the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to switch canvases off because I don't think I want those anymore. Um, I'm going to go, I think I'll, I'll keep the first Wonderland. No, I won't even do that. I'm going to go and re-render the whole, the whole Wonderland uh, thing again. Same aspect ratio, same setting, same spherical camera. And I'm going to go over to the tone mapping and just make a mental note of this. So 9.1, why don't we call it 9? Let's just, no, actually, let's, let's leave it, let's leave it exactly like it is. I'm going to go and render this out at, I might even say, yeah, 100, 100 is, 100 is fine. <laughs> let's go render this out. This is going to be a regular PNG image. So I'm going to render this out at least three times, maybe even five times. And I'm going to vary the exposure a little bit. So the first pass is going to be something I'll, I'll call EV0. So that doesn't deviate from what I'd like the HDRI to look like. So this is going to be our essentially our base image. What you can see, though, is that some of the dark passages there might be some crushed blacks going on. Likewise, in passages like this, there's definitely some light clipping going on. So you'll see that some of the color information is lost here and there, and I think especially over here. So for that, we need images that are underexposed, that basically make this even darker, but bring out all the nuances that are in these bits and pieces here. And we do that because otherwise it, it looks like it, it looks like broken if we were to use this one image as a HDRI. It's not a HDRI, this is why. So anything like this here, there's more colors in here than the JPEG can show. So I'm going to call this one Wonderland EV0 and put it on the desktop. And I'm going to use something that the photographers call bracketed exposure. So bracketing means you live with the fact that your camera or your film or your, your CMOS sensor can't really capture what the world has to offer, the dynamic range the world has to offer. And you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to capture portions of it, and then I'm going to stitch it all together and turn it all into a 32-bit HDRI. But I'm going to do this in a controlled manner. So on the tone mapping, it's the easiest way to, to do that. The exposure value, the shutter speed, the f-stop, and the film ISO are all related. And it doesn't really matter which one of these you adjust as long as you know what you're doing. So I'm going to go and uh, I could use the film ISO. I could go from 100 to uh, to 400. That would, be, uh, that would be overexposing this. Or I could go to... 50 kind of 25 that will be underexposing it i could also change my f-stop but since this is a rounded number i'm going to go and deal with the exposure values here so if i go and just go to the end here no matter what what the value is here, so 9.1 let's go and just remember that collectively if i go and say mine is true here then you can see that i'm overexposing my image so i'm now this is like ev minus two essentially let's render that out and I'm going to go and render out one with uh, EV plus two, essentially. And this is going to look, this is going to be good for anything that was dark. So we're now essentially boosting information in these areas here. The lighter passages, they look even worse than before, but we're okay with that because we're only concerned with darker passages. I don't think we have quite that many. But we need to do an equal number either side so that Photoshop can go and combine these together. 9.1. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Oop, there. Pim is doing good. That is good. That is, that's good to hear. How are you all doing? While we wait for the computer to render, let's, let's have a chat. Okay, that was... EV, so this is a little bit weird um, to remember. I'm just going to call this um, EV minus minus two. Just, you know, we're going to have to do the opposite when it comes to Photoshop, but, you know, bear with me on this. 
So this was minus two. Save that out. So if I wanted to go the other way, I'll essentially go and say uh, plus two. That'll get us back to the original value. I'm going to do that again. So plus two. Now the image gets darker. Therefore, if I render that out again, this is going to help the lighter passages now in the image. So anything where the lights were, and literally we're probably going to have to do that one more time. But I might just, you know, just show you what this comes out as, and then we'll we'll decide if we wanted to do this again. For the sake of repetition, we might even do that. So now I can still see there's probably some information lost here. The darker passages are even darker, but we're gaining some more values in the lighter bits and pieces. So by all means, do it with larger brackets, do it with more images. I could literally go and say plus, uh, plus two again and minus two again and then have an even darker image and an even lighter image. I could do that. I'm going to stick with three for now. Just know that you can have as many as you want. And we might even do that. I'll just you know, have, have two passes and see how that, how that fares. So this one was now EV plus two. All right. <laughs> this is exciting. So with those three images uh, by itself, here there were zero minus two and plus two we can't really do much other than look at it but if we go and use photoshop or other programs that that support this feature we can ask it to combine them into this magical 32-bit uh, hdri and then use that and this introduces or opens up another whole can of worms because there's so many things you can do to images in photoshop um, so bear with me. It's also especially important for those of you who don't have Photoshop, don't feel obliged to use it. Other softwares can do it, but this is the one that I'm using, so I'm most familiar with that. We're not opening the images directly. We're heading over to File, Automate, and then there's this thing called Merge to HDR Pro. And that is essentially a script that Photoshop runs. A little dialog comes up uh, in which we can now either um, add open files or hold folders or we just browse to images that we want to use. So mine are all on the desktop here, which is Wonderland, all these three. There they are. And um, the first script that it runs is that it'll load these into what's known as a stack. So it'll just stack them on top of one another just so that they're all in its memory. And then it'll give us a little adjustment dialog in which we tell Photoshop how over or underexposed each image was. And that's really helpful. As I said, you can have five, you could have seven, you can have as many as you like. So here we can switch between them. So these values here, they don't really matter. Once again, like in the tone mapper settings, it doesn't matter which one you change as long as you know which one you, you want to change. So you can use these or you can just switch this over to EVs and then, um, uh, you know, go go by go by that. So I'm literally leaving that in place. I'm going to the next one, which was uh, plus two. So I'm going to call this one 11.75. It's it's recognized correctly that 9.75 was the correct exposure value for this. And so in this one here, this one was 11. And then this one here was seven, wasn't it? There. That's how we'll do it. You have to press return and then just step through and see if it's recognized this value on every picture here. And then hit OK. And then uh, see if I've done it correctly. I think I may have done it incorrectly. I think I have to switch it around. I think I've, I have to switch minus and plus around. I think I have to do that. Right, this might work. This might work. Remove ghosts here. So this, there's a couple of settings here. This here, under mode, we need to be in 32-bit mode so that all the processing happens in 32-bit. If you switch it to 16 or 8-bit, then the, the color spectrum is going to be adjusted. But also some processing can happen here. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave it all in 32-bit. And remove ghosts. This is really for real-life uh, photography where if you imagine you you take a picture of a mountain range and there's birds flying through the picture and you're you're bracketed three pictures the bird might be traveling so it's on the left uh, then in the middle and then on the right on all these three pictures that you've taken and um, remove ghosts would try to uh, get rid of those 
I'm not entirely sure if I've done it correctly or not. Let's go, let's go leave it on and say OK for now. I think I may have done it wrong here. If there we go, this is this is apparently now our HDRI. I think I've done it wrong. I think I've done it wrong. Let me just try this out under edit. No, under image. Somewhere no, it was under edit. It was. It's called HDR toning. Where is it? Could be under image adjustments. HDR toning. This is where you can make adjustments in uh, in 32 bit. I think maybe this is what we need to do. I just leave this on local adaption and hit OK. I think this is kind of what I'm expecting. Yeah, I think I've done it wrong. I think I've done it wrong. <laughs> Let's try it out and see if I've done I've done it wrong or not. Let's go and save this out. And I'll um, I'll call it. Wonderland HDRI V1. And on the bottom here, you can save it either as open EXR. All Radiance HDR. They're both different formats. I, I'm going to use EXR because I know Dash Studio supports that natively. It'll ask me compression. We'll say no. I think I've done the I think I've done the values for the images incorrectly. Uh, let's see. David, good question. I don't really know. I would imagine, I mean, GIMP is a very capable editor. Same with um, PaintShop Pro, Brian. Do you know if this is available in PaintShop Pro, this sort of feature? I wouldn't be surprised if it was. There's specialized programs that you can use for that as well. Wonderland HDRI V1. Let's go do this. See what it looks like. I have a feeling I've just I've just mixed it all up. Yes, it looks it looks totally washed out. This is I think I've just mixed up the values. Let's go do this again. Let's go do this again. Yeah, let's go do this again. It also helps to to put it um, to put it into into all our minds. So automate merge to HDR Pro. We go and browse to our three images here. I remember there was some some switcheroo going on, and I think it was minus was plus and plus was minus when we define those values. Bear with this color. Yes, exactly. And if, if GIMP doesn't have it natively, like like Nate says, then there's probably a plugin for that. I wouldn't even be surprised if Blender can do this, you know, with a compositor. I'm I'm wouldn't be surprised at all. So again, I'm going to use exposure values and I'm actually going to use uh, zero is going to be this so I'm going to let that alone but then plus two I'm actually going to make this the minus two I think that's what you have to do and then on the one that is actually minus two you're going to make that plus two I don't really ask me why that is <laughs> but I think that's just you know how the cookie crumbles We got it here. We got it. We got it. 32. We got it here. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> let's let's try it out. In testing, this worked so well, you know, <laughs> as it as it often does. Uh, default. This this basically just uh, adjusts anything that could be stretched into something like that. I think this might this might actually work. This might work. So let's go and save this out again. And uh, I'll, I'll also talk about, this is going to be EXR again. This is going to be Wonderland V2 EXR. Check. I'll also show you, if you only had a single exposure image, how you can turn these over and underexposed images uh, of something that you could otherwise not change in Photoshop. I'll do that as well. This is my HDRI test instance thing here. Wonderland V2. Let's hope that looks a little bit better. 
<laughs> right, Misty, you're absolutely right. It helps me as well. You're gonna make a mistake like 20 times and then, and then you stop doing it. Let me make the mistakes for you so you don't have to. Yes, look, that is, that is what I had expected. That is what I had expected. And um, so this looks like the HDRI that we, that we want. And then if we wanted to make that uh, a little bit darker, we can do that. Darker, moodier, lighter, whatever. Uh, increase the contrast, you can do that as well in Photoshop. So you have some influence over what happens uh, with your HDR image. And we now have more tonal range than we could ever get out of a single render. And um, so it's still not perfect. So you still see that some of these lights up here are kind of blown out. Uh, this as well, if we were to, can we zoom in? Yeah, we can, good stuff. So you can still see that this, it looks a little uglier than in the, whoops, <laughs> than in the original. And this is where more bracketed exposures would be helpful. So if we go back and have another two brackets, uh, two stops up and two stops down and add that to the collection in Photoshop, those types of effects would be minimized and eventually completely go away. Uh, so that's that's kind of nice. Okay, if we do have time, we almost have, I might, I might just do that, I might just do that. But look how beautiful that is. And now we have all the tone mapping effects that we saw in the original render settings um, directly here inside, uh, inside the HDRI at the fraction of the render time. So now you can literally position your characters and uh, you get all these beautiful reflections, even without the dome. You see all these, these exciting, colorful cyberpunk bits and pieces in here. Isn't that cool? I absolutely love this. And it's just this, this huge playground of experimentation. And of course you can go and bring this into Blender and render with this HDRI inside Blender also possible. It's just so, so cool. Remove the fourth layer. What's the fourth layer, Joseph? I don't know what that is. And um, do you know, uh, Snellen, that is that is almost possible. Maybe I'll show you that as well. Let me show you both of these things. So I think, first of all, let's see if we can improve upon this with a version three of this by just going, and I'll have to sadly just close this down and go back to, go back to this and go instead of 11, I'll say, so I'll, I'll, once again, I'll say plus two. That'll make it even darker and that's gonna be better for the lights up there. I'll go and render this out. And then I think um, that is, I don't need another one. I don't need a, an even brighter one. I, I can have that, but I don't think it's strictly necessary. So it doesn't have to be an even number, sorry, an odd number of images. I think it can be an even number. And you can even have bigger steps, so you don't have to have a, a two-stop gap. You can have a five-stop five, um, five gap if you like. But yeah, I think this is going to help just describe more detail in these things here. I think. And then also we see it once, once more. Isn't that beautiful? I'm so glad you think so too. I'm, I'm so glad you think so too, because it's just one of those things where this is built into Das Studio. Seriously, this is, this comes kind of free with Das Studio, getting HDRIs out of it. Yes, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, and you can experiment so much and see how you can work it into your workflow. You can even turn these into products because they're 2D images. You can literally um, sell them as, as products, especially if you, um, string several positions together. This would be a, a beautiful product, really. I'll call this plus four and save that out. Especially if you if you take the time and render them really large at really, a really high resolution, if you give people options for small, medium, and large HDRI, which you can all do. So let's go through this process again, now with the fourth image that we've rendered. So automate, merge to HDR Pro, Browse to your files, which is this one, that one, that one, and that one. Perfect. Let's make version three and see if it improves the, the lighting there. This is exciting. <laughs> Mix going to bed. No worries. No worries. 
<laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate that. I appreciate all of you being here. It's always really, really nice to hang out with these experimental sessions. I'm looking forward to next Saturday already. If you if you can make it and if you're a DAS Plus subscriber, then please join us in the in another DAS Plus stream, uh, literally one week from now, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, in which I'm going to show you how to convert skin textures from older generation Genesis characters from Genesis 2 and 3 onto and 8 onto the new Genesis 9 figure with a magic Russian tool called R3DS Wrap. Very cool. It's really cool. It works extremely well and it's um it's just it's just beautiful to see this in action. So I'm gonna use EVs again and I'm gonna I'm gonna use um this time it looks like it hasn't detected anything, so that's cool. I'm gonna use zero for zero. That's what we want here. Then I'm gonna have the minus two here, which I'm gonna call just two, because that's how the cookie crumbles. So minus becomes plus then zero is zero, then plus becomes minus. So this is now minus four, and this one is now minus two. And if you had any more, you'd have, you'd have more. Let's see if that improves the definition. We're good with this. Let's not remove the ghosts. Let's just click OK at the bottom right. No matter what it looks like, we don't want to worry about that too much. But now the all important step, essentially equalizing all the data that we have out so that there's no big gaps at the top and the bottom. And that happens under edit. No, it doesn't. Under image adjustments, HDR toning. And then once again, there's, there's several things here. So the preset I'm using default and the method I'm using local adaption. So there's other things that you can try like exposure and gamma or uh, highlight compression. Uh, many of the other bits and pieces. The highlight compression might actually also work. Uh, might, might try that. Or just local adaption is, uh, you know, I, either one of these. Maybe we'll try highlight compression. Hit OK. See what that does. And see also see what that looks like. Sadly, we only get one shot at this. So if we, <laughs> if we wanted to, I think we can save it out and then uh, undo and save another one with the local adaption. Um, this one is EXR. That's the other important bit. Don't save it as a PSD. Just save it as a as an EXR or as a HDR. So this one was uh, highlights. I'll just call it EXR. No compression. Let me just go and undo HDR toning and do this again. So image adjustments, HDR toning. And I'm going to use local adaption this time, just so that we can, you know, see a bit of a difference. Maybe, maybe we don't. I haven't tried this out. So this is what is so exciting about this Wonderland V3. And in this case, it's not highlights, it's local adaption. If you like, I can upload these into a Dropbox folder and you can, you can have them and play around with them. If you like, do let me know. I'm happy to make that happen. So, first of all, uh, highlights version three. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Show you how to convert them to Subnautica. Or even better, Ascania, use NVIDIA Ansel inside Subnautica to take, to take spherical images. Hmm, curious. And so this is something we were we were thinking about. Sadly, we're running out of time, but that might be a good good idea to use for uh, for another session to use video games to take spherical images out of it and use them in DAS Studio. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Like imagine you're playing a an adventure game and you uh, you go and you find a really cool location. You take a HDRI at that position, and then you bring in a Genesis character into DAS Studio and use that. Bring that together. Pfft, mind blown. Does this look better? I think marginally so. I think now we're literally looking at increasing the resolution. So I don't see any burnt bits and pieces anymore. I just see lowish type resolution in these effects now. So um, not bad. Not bad. Same with the water. I think what would now help us if we either render it longer or make it, you know, make it a little bit larger uh, in regards to resolution. So 2000 by 4000, make it 4000 by 8000. Um, 
But yeah, well, I think as, as big as you can is 10,000 by 5,000 in Dash Studio. Or another cool idea, before you combine these things in Photoshop, up them with something like uh, like Gigapixel. That's another cool idea. So then, you know, make, by all means, make a 4,000 by 8,000 render, but then up them to something like five times the size, then combine them into a HDRI, also possible. I think they have a sale on right now at um, Topaz. I think their whole... Um, uh, still image gallery. I think the uh, Denoiser sharpener and the Gigapixel Upreza uh, is currently on sale. How does the other one compare? Before we go quickly into Photoshop, and I'll show you how a regular picture, how you could bracket a regular picture. This was the highlights, and then we had the local adaption. See how that how that varies. Give us a second. Yeah, I think preservation of highlights actually worked a little better. This is kind of, this this bit in the middle is kind of becoming white, so that's usually a sign that things are clipping. I don't think there's a massive difference, but preserve highlights in this case might have might have been the, the, better, the better choice, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David, um, as I said, on my, on my channel, you'll find video that shows you how to convert Genesis 2 to Genesis 9. And I've also got a video that shows you how to do Genesis 8 to Genesis 9. And it's a method I call the Fitsuit method. So it's, it's, um, it's, we use the Genesis 9 geometry, turn it into clothing that the older generation can wear. Then you turn in a morph, so Genesis 9 deforms. Then you export that out and import it as a morph into Genesis 9. And you do some magic fixes. And that's, you know, that's how you can do that. Um, for Genesis 1, the, T-pose that Genesis one is in differs greatly for for the one how we that we have on Genesis two. So uh, Genesis nine has a fit clone that matches almost exactly with Genesis two, but not with Genesis one. So if you want to do that, Genesis one to two, same method. Then two to nine, you can do it. You can do it. Seb, how's it going? How you doing? Okay, one last thing I will show you, and I might just use my. Uh, my earlier render that I've shown you, it's not um, it's not really suitable for it as such, but I'm going to show you because it's a it's a no, I'm going to show you with this. I'm going to show you with the with the medieval thing. So imagine this is your this is the image that you want to turn into a bracketed HDRI, but you don't have an overexposed or an underexposed version of this image and it doesn't matter which which image you use i, I could have also used my uh, my victoria image here which wasn't spherical but um you know it's it's okay it doesn't it doesn't really matter uh what what the image is either one will will work let's use the spherical one um there is a thing in photoshop that lets you that lets you change the values or the, the, the levels in a very controlled fashion. And what we're looking for is the exposure value. So we need to create similar conditions that we had for the render, uh, just you know, from a single image. So with this here, if you have your image loaded here on Photoshop, that's on this little icon here, the little yin yang icon on the bottom, you right click that and you add exposure. And this is an adjustment layer. This is a non-destructive uh, thing that you can that you can fiddle with at the top here. And um, gamma and offset we're gonna leave in place, but exposure is the value we're gonna play with. So if you type in one here, then you add essentially one stop to to the exposure of this image and you do that you can also type in minus one and the filter is very gentle so if there is additional detail in your source image uh, then it will it will try to bring that out uh, so you can have, type in minus one minus two for example so in our case with the two brackets you would type in minus two then you would save this image out as a uh, as a png so like either file um, I would use export and then I would probably export as or change your quick export options. Don't use JPEG, use a PNG for this. Don't use transparency for this. Uh, save this out. And let's call it um, fake HDRI. 
And I'll call this one fake minus two. And then you change this to whoops, plus two. And that's essentially your overexposed version. And you save that out. So export, where was it? Hello. Export as PNG, no transparency. Thanks. And this one's called fake plus two. And we have already had the original, so we don't need to um, we don't need to save it out again. But I can just so that we have them all the three of them in the same uh, folder here. Once again, no transparency. That's cool. And we're going to call this one fake zero. And then you can do the same thing and combine these into kind of a fake HDRI. So let's go do that. So it's the yeah. So the magic is the exposure um, filter here. So yin yang icon, and then use exposure. And so then we use the same script as before. File automate merge to HDR Pro. Browse to the images, which was fake HDRI. Reload all three. It would be kind of interesting to see what this looks like compared to the to the real HDRI that we've made. That would be really, really interesting to see. Do we see a difference? <laughs> to merge may have been taken with different cameras. Ooh, okay. Um, they, they weren't, but thanks. <laughs> it's warning us. That is nice. So once again, we're using EV. And zero is zero. Minus two becomes plus two. And then plus two becomes minus two. Okay. Does that work? Yes. Yes, that works. Okay. How exciting. Bigger tonal range. We also have a 32 bit image. So, once again, under is image adjustment HDR toning. Let's use the highlight compression here. See what it looks like. So, I don't think it looks great but that's because we didn't exactly have detail that we were that we were faking but it certainly is something you can you can try to play with there may be better ways to do this like i've i've just uh, had word that there is that there is an iphone app that you can get for free that was called was it red eye something like that it was a let's it's a thing that lets you take a hdri directly from your phone and it does all this processing for you in the camera which is really really cool i need to i need to check that out i think i've downloaded it already but i haven't had a chance to try it yet we're going to call it fake hdri and we'll see what it looks like so judging by the amount of detail here it's it's not great but uh it's certainly something you can explore. And also sometimes you just don't have a choice. Do we have a sphere? Yes, we have a sphere. Switch it over to Irie and, ooh, okay. Hey, other than it just being a little bright here, it's something we've already seen in the HDRI. Maybe if we make it darker, hey, that's not bad. So we have we don't have the whole dynamic range, but we certainly have. You know, it doesn't it doesn't look terrible, especially if you use it as a as something you wanna you wanna blur out later. You can probably do some some more processing on it. Uh, sadly, what doesn't look good is if you just use a JPEG image directly in here. So I could have also, instead of an actual HDRI, I could have just used a JPEG image right in here. That is also possible, but that doesn't look good. So if I go and use the, the one in the middle here, that doesn't look that doesn't look great. I mean it does, you know, it's 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 almost the same as what I saw um, what I saw with a fake HDRI. So I think the Photoshop processing has brought out some details that were that were beneficial here. 
But if you have nothing else, you can just literally stick in the, the maybe slightly contrast enhanced um, JPEG or PNG image right in here. And you know, if that is good enough for what you're looking for, roll with it. Let me go and have a quick look at some of the questions that are probably overlooked. Why do some people hate the denoiser? Um, we've, we've talked about that already. Michael Whaley, should the headlamp be off on the camera? Yes, absolutely. I don't know if it actually gets switched off automatically, but just in case um, yours isn't set to, to off all the time, this is where I do it, on the Render Settings tab under uh, General. There is the MISC section and there is the auto headlamp thing. I would switch that to never and never look back. So this, um, I don't know if it applies to spherical cameras, to be honest, I, it may, it may not. So many of the parameters that I see on the, on the cameras tab aren't actually working. So I would imagine the headlamp one is one of those, but I haven't tested this. Yes, so just to be on the safe side, uh, under render settings, general MISC, auto headlamp switch that to never and uh, and leave it there that's that's what i would do and i'm you know i'm, I'm sleeping good at night Uh, Casey, what does the number value mean in the environment intensity it's it's literally just a float value so in um in here, this is what you mean, right? It's literally just a just a float value. Um, there's default, so environment map. I don't know why this is set to two by default rather than uh, rather than one, but um, yeah, that's the, this one's set to one. This one's set to two, and anything that deviates from that just makes it a, makes the exposure lighter or darker. Um, I don't think it has an actual meaning. It's just it's just the default value. Uh, Gimperita, did you try this with Wonderland? Would it work on uh, low-key scenes? Probably, yes, it will. So once again, this this whole combining um, images in Photoshop that is only really necessary if you can't render an, a, an environment lighting canvas out directly from that studio. I think that is the one I would try first, and then remember the ten thousand divide by ten thousand on the.